Alright guys, I'll just take one minute of your precious time. Just wanted to let all of you know that if you want to practice all these questions using artificial intelligence and practice on a portal which is as similar as your actual PT exam which will give you exact scores which you are likely to get in your exam, just register on languageacademy.com.au. You can practice as many questions. On top of that, you can get instant feedback, instant scores and instant suggestions on what are the things you need to work on and how to improve your mistakes and turn them into your strength. You can also take a full scored mock test. You'll get a full scorecard. You'll get in-depth analysis. You'll get tutors feedback. One mock test is available for free and four sectional mock tests are available for free. You just need to go on languageacademy.com.au, register over there. Use Google Chrome, log in and practice and make sure you get your desired score at the earliest. Now you can continue with the video or you can just log on to languageacademy.com.au and practice all these questions over there as well. All the very best. I'll see you very soon. So when we're talking about ideal hotels, what do you think is an ideal hotel for you? Um, that's a tough question, but when I choose a hotel, I would um, look at where the hotel is located right. and also the food. Right. So as long as the hotel is um, surrounded by nature, um, you know, preferably on the water. Okay. And maybe some mountains in the back. <laughs> and um, if the food, the breakfast and mm, dinner and you know all the food that they have is amazing, I'm good. I'm set. Now, what about facilities? I mean, you know, hotels have various facilities, whether it's gyms or um, movie rooms or computer rooms that allow you to do, you know, Internet and various things. Um, you know, some hotels have pools. Would those be things that you would want in your ideal hotel? China will become the world's safest and largest investment economy in times to come given the following factors huge market potential rich labor resources comparative advantage in labor costs sound corporate governance and stable government and society all these factors will further attract the inflow of foreign capital into China in short China's economy will grow even faster in the future in the next 15 years China's economy will still increase at a rate 7% to 8% in year 2020, should price index remain the same as today, GDP will amount to US $4.8 trillion. GDP per capita per capita will reach US $3,300. However, the level of GDP per capita is still very low in China at the moment. GDP per capita's growth is still at a slow rate. GDP per capita will have to be further increased in order to raise China's standard of living so as to bridge the present income gap between the rich and the poor satisfaction of consumers' needs can be the main driver in raising China's living standards. Domestic demand will increase as the economy grows. Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Ra was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Penn Lebery, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. 
Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Naranet works, which were only found after his death. The growth of the modern state brought with it the development of mass political parties and the emergence of professional politicians. A man whose occupation is the struggle for political power may go about it in two ways. First, a person who relies on their political activities to supply their main source of income is said to live off politics, while a person who engages in full-time political activities, but who doesn't receive an income from it, is said to live for politics. Now, a political system in which recruitment to positions of power is filled by those who live for politics is necessarily drawn from a property-owning elite who are not usually entrepreneurs. However, this is not to imply that such politicians will necessarily pursue policies which are wholly biased towards the interests of the class they originate from. There have been many studies in America of the opinions and behavior of university lecturers and professors, and of well-known, free, or public thinkers, who are not attached to a university or other institutions, which show that those who are recognized as being more successful or productive as scholars in their field, or are at the best universities, are much more likely to have critical opinions, that is to say that they are more likely to hold liberal views in the American use of that word than those of their colleagues who are less creative or who have less of a reputation, the better a university is, as measured by the test results of its students or by the prestige of its staff, the more likely it has been that there will be student unrest and a relatively left of center faculty. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moves smoothly. But soon, the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track, but the jam spread backward around the track, like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real-life jams move backward at about the same speed. Now that story's been scotched, as only part of contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed, even earlier this year, says Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? 
considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Murray. Something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is their predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? There are some 250 million cars in America. 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied, who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. Then they asked, how far, out of their league, do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. However simple or complex the chain of events in any given situation, when looked into it usually reveals a train of causal relationships they are seen to be linked in some way. The methods of analysis aim to establish these relationships and provide a solid background for useful generalizations based on what at first appear to be separate events. The first step in this process is to collect facts, and then see if any particular patterns emerge. If they do, it then becomes possible to form theories related to the facts and this type of empirical theory forms a useful basis for analysis and prediction. However, on its own this theory is not enough. The essential second step is to test it by collecting more facts and by checking predictions against events. These new facts may mean you have to modify the theory, bearing in mind that new facts can only either disprove or support a theory they cannot prove it to be right. There is such a thing as information overload. There is just so much information out there now that we can't cope with it or fully absorb it, or even decide which bits of it we want to keep in our minds, or which to discard. There is a similar thing going on with the range of choices we have as consumers. There is so much stuff out there, so much to choose from, that, according to some experts, 
This situation is making us miserable. Most of us believe that the more we have to choose from the better. Yet apparently our dissatisfaction with this wealth of choice, or rather the anxiety it produces, is part of a larger tract. It seems that, as society grows more affluent and people become freer to do what they want, the unhappier they become. So, you're from Chile? Yeah, that's right. If I ever travel to Chile, do you have any tips? Well, yeah, there are a lot of things that you should do in Chile and also a lot of things that you shouldn't do in Chile. Oh, for example? Um, well, I would definitely recommend to try Chilean food, um, especially in the small shops that we have like in every street uh, if you go to like big restaurants it's not going to be really authentic so I think you should try small shops um, in every street also if you're interested in nature um, well you know Chile has a really long um, mountains right and they're beautiful especially if you go in winter uh, you can go skiing and it's not far it's about like two hours from like anywhere so that's really cool I, you should definitely do that um, also one thing uh, remember that is uh, Latin America so you have to take care of your belongings a lot of my friends have lost stuff there Postmodernism is broadly speaking a reaction against the movement or the period, or perhaps simply the values and beliefs of modernism. Most people, even those who seem to know what it is or was about, tend to define it in negative terms by telling us what it isn't, or doesn't do. Initially the term had a fairly limited application and referred to a new anti-modernist style of architecture. But it spread like a virus to include almost all aspects of contemporary culture. One thing we can be sure about is that it wanted to get rid of what were called the grand narratives by which we explained how the world and history got us from the past to the present. Another feature of postmodernism is its belief that truth and reality are human-centered and internal. That is, the primary source of truth in the present age is the self. This, I believe, has now all passed and been thrown in the rubbish bin of history. In its short life, the Internet has become an agent of revolutionary change and is one of the fastest tools to promote and defend freedom and to facilitate democratic access to information and knowledge. It has emerged as one of today's greatest instruments of progress and has gradually become a part of the vital infrastructure of global social, economic, cultural and political life. The Internet's effect on our lives is pervasive. Over the past decade, the use of email, the web and blogs have become part of the daily routine of more than a billion internet users. Today the internet access touch points have outgrown the traditional PC-based internet browsers, Internet Explorer, Firefox, to desktop applications, mobile phones and satellite navigational devices in vehicles and living rooms.
Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honour. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialise outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk prompting wild swings in the prices of the key derivatives. It was the third day of frenetic activity in the European credit markets, suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. The internet revolution is yet to happen in India. Like the way it has happened with cell phones and cable TV. While it's common to see everyone from auto drivers to senior citizens with cell phones, you will rarely find an auto driver who visits a cyber cafe to check his email. This has to do with opportunity cost involved in spending time in cyber cafes and most importantly the lack of services to target a large part of India. The internet too largely uses American standard code for information interchange. This alienates many communities from the boon of computers and internet. The fact remains that most of India's billion people are denied access to the internet and not only because they don't have a connection or a computer. The digital revolution is leaving them behind because they don't speak English, the dominant language of the web. Fighting in Afghanistan and Pakistan meant that polio eradication did not go well in those countries in 2007, a World Health Organization report said last week. They are two of the last four nations that have not eliminated the disease in Afghanistan. Most cases were in southern provinces under Taliban control. In Pakistan, many were in the remote tribal border areas where Osama bin Laden is still being pursued and local militants are battling the government. Polio experts see the territory differently, as one, epidemiological block, with two transmission corridors, one in the mountainous north, where cases of the polio strain known as type 1 are common, and one in the flatter south, where type 3 prevails. Tribes migrate east-west across the borders, following harvests, trade routes and jobs. Polio went as far southeast as Karachi, where there is no fighting, but immunization drives remain weak, the report said.
Most patients with type 2 diabetes should start taking statins, the cholesterol-fighting drugs, as a preventative measure against heart disease, whether or not they have high cholesterol levels. According to new guidelines released yesterday, the recommendations from the American College of Physicians call for moderate doses of statins by people with diabetes who are older than 55 and for younger patients who have any other risk factor for heart disease, like high blood pressure or a history of smoking. The new guidelines are outlined in April 20 issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine, in an article that noted that about 16 million Americans have type 2 diabetes and that 800,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. The lead author of an article accompanying the guidelines, Dr. Sandeep Vijan of the University of Michigan, said that almost everyone with type 2 diabetes should be on a statin. This being acquired and established, silence would be more easy, and my desire being to gain knowledge at the same time that I improved in virtue, and considering that in conversation it was obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue, and therefore wishing to break a habit I was getting into of prattling, punning, and joking, which only made me acceptable to trifling company. I gave silence the second place, this and the next, order. I expected would allow me more time for attending to my project and my studies. Resolution. Once become habitual. Would keep me firm in my endeavors to obtain all the subsequent virtues. Frugality and industry freeing me from my remaining debt. And producing affluence and independence. Would make more easy the practice of sincerity and justice. Etc. At supper Johnson talked of good eating with uncommon satisfaction. Some people, said he, have a foolish way of not minding, or pretending not to mind, what they eat. For my part, I mind my belly very studiously, and very carefully, for I look upon it, that he who does not mind his belly will hardly mind anything else. He was, for the moment, not only serious but vehement. Yet I have heard him, upon other occasions, talk with great contempt of people who were anxious to gratify their palates, and the 206th number of his Rambler is a masterly essay against Golosity. His practice, indeed, I must acknowledge, may be considered as casting the balance of his different opinions upon this subject, for I never knew any man who relished good eating more than he did. When at table, he was totally absorbed in the business of the moment. His looks seemed riveted to his plate. Nor would he, unless when in very high company, say one word, or even pay the least attention to what was said by others, till he had satisfied his appetite, which was so fierce, and indulged with such intenseness, that while in the act of eating, the veins of his forehead swelled, and generally a strong perspiration was visible, to those whose sensations were delicate, this could not but be disgusting, and it was doubtless not very suitable to the character of a philosopher, who should be distinguished by self-command. But it must be owned, that Johnson, though he could be rigidly abstemious, 
was not a temperate man either in eating or drinking. He could refrain. But he could not use moderately. They who beheld with wonder how much he eat upon all occasions when his dinner was to his taste, could not easily conceive what he must have meant by hunger. And not only was he remarkable for the extraordinary quantity which he eat, but he was, or affected to be, a man of very nice discernment. In the science of cookery, he used to descant critically on the dishes which had been at table where he had dined or supped, and to recollect very minutely what he had liked. I remember, when he was in Scotland, his praising, Gordon's palates, a dish of palates at the Honorable Alexander Gordon's, with a warmth of expression which might have done honor to more important subjects. As for Maclaurin's imitation of a made dish, it was a wretched attempt. It is difficult to know how to place Montesquieu if you're the kind of person who likes to categorize historian, political philosopher, sociologist, jurist or if you think the Persian letters a novel, a novelist he was all these things, perhaps, as some have, he could be placed among that almost extinct species, the man of letters, the books that make up the spirit of the laws have had the most influence on later thinkers, and in them, as in his equally great considerations on the causes of the grandeur and decadence of the Romans, he makes his underlying purpose clear. It is to make the random, apparently meaningless variety of events understandable. He wanted to find out what the historical truth was. His starting point then was this almost endless variety of morals, customs, ideas, laws and institutions and to make some sense out of them. Privacy and the right to privacy are increasingly becoming hot topics in the media, which is a touch ironic, given that it is often the media that is responsible for invasion of privacy. This is not just about those whose careers put them in the public eye, but ordinary people who through no fault of their own have come to public notice because of some event that has attracted the attention of the media. It might be that a member of their family has been imprisoned for some crime, rightfully or wrongfully. Or perhaps they are the victims of some natural disaster. Some people argue that those who have chosen to be in the public sphere and have teams of public relations people to make sure they get as much public attention as possible actors, rock stars, politicians and the like have given up their right to privacy and gel everything they deserve.
most likely a Mars mission will require transporting most of the necessary supplies and equipment by unmanned spacecraft to the chosen landing area and confirming their operable condition before the first astronauts even arrive. During their long, confined stay, the Mars pioneers may live in an inflatable modular housing unit as a possible replacement for the U.S. crew quarters on the International Space Station. The cylindrical structure would be 27 feet in diameter and have a foot-thick protective shell when inflated. The shell would be made of almost two dozen layers of material that is stronger than steel. It would also provide insulation from the extreme Martian temperatures that range from 128.3 degrees Celsius during the polar night to 26.6 degrees Celsius at the equator. The module would consist of four levels for work, healthcare, crew quarters, and a galley area. The space travelers will drive for miles across the planet's diverse terrain in advanced type roving vehicles equipped with specialized tools, drills, and analytical instruments. There are few among us that did not wonder in awe about what it would be like to be an astronaut. Space exploration will forever pique humanity's interest and curiosity. The prestige of visiting outer space belongs to a proud few. But as technology develops, more and more people will have the opportunity. The Fédération Aéronautique Internationale states that a man or woman officially becomes an astronaut upon reaching an altitude of over 100 miles. As of March 30th. 2006. 443 people have crossed this imaginary line. Efforts to learn more about space are widespread. Since the astronaut Yuri Gagarin made his pioneering exit out of our atmosphere, men and women from 35 countries have joined his notoriety. During the race to space in the early 1960s, the United States began Project Apollo, a campaign launched to compete with the efforts of Russian scientists and future cosmonauts. The headlines tell us that the world is now more urban than rural. Surely this fact ought to have profound consequences that call for new attitudes and public policies. However, as is often the case with profound change, what actually is happening and how we should view these changes is extremely murky. From one point of view, the vast migration of people from the countryside to the city is simply the latest chapter in a story that has played out worldwide over the last several centuries first in the most affluent nations of the West, and now in the developing world, as more efficient agriculture has reduced the number of people needed in the fields, the rise of new urban economies has drawn them to cities. Every time this push-pull phenomenon has shifted into high gear, whether in London in the 19th century or in Mumbai today, there have been wrenching dislocations followed by attempts on the part of public authorities to stop or slow the process. Crime in the United States accounts for more death, injuries and loss of property than all natural disasters combined. 
the Disaster Center is pleased to be able to provide you with access to the statistics of crime compiled by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. When you experience a crime it can make you respond in ways that you might not understand. In that crisis situation you may react in ways that conflict with the assumptions you have created about yourself. At the time of the crime you may feel a sense of helplessness, fear and anger. Afterward you may have a hard time relating the experience to the context of the assumptions of your life. A conflict often develops between your idea of the world before the crime and your idea of the world after the disaster. On top of this the victims and their relatives often experience financial problems. And time is often lost from work to handle the legal, insurance and personal problems associated with being a victim. Cities and towns are not only growing in size and number. They are also gaining new influence. The urban transition offers significant opportunities to improve the quality of life. But whether this potential is realized depends critically on how cities are managed and on the national and local policies affecting their development. The development of urban areas is also closely linked to the rural economy through the exchange of labor, goods, services, information and technology. Neglecting urban issues leads to significant social and environmental costs. However, in the two most urbanized regions that the World Bank serves, Latin America and Europe, Central Asia, over half of the poor already live in urban areas. By 2025, two-thirds of the poor in these regions, and one-third of the poor in East and South Asia, will reside in cities or towns. A 25-year-old man who told the police he was tired of life went on a killing rampage in a popular shopping street in central Tokyo on Sunday, plowing his truck into a crowd of pedestrians before stabbing passers-by with a survival knife. Seven people died and 11 were injured. The attack took place shortly after noon on a street that had been closed to vehicles for the day in Akihabara. The main district for electronics in Tokyo and a magnet for fans of Japanese anime and manga comics. The killings stunned a country that has long enjoyed low crime rates but where a series of random stabbings have recently occurred. The police identified the attacker as Tomohiro Kato, who was living by himself in a small apartment in Shizuoka, just west of Tokyo. According to reports in the Japanese news media, Mr. Kato told the police that he had grown tired of life, hated the world, and had gone to Akihabara to kill people. Most observers tend to extrapolate current trends and assume that what we see now will continue moving in the same direction ever larger cities, etc. I don't see it that way. The global energy predicament now gathering around us will synergize with climate change to produce a very different outcome. I think we'll eventually see a reversal of the 200-year-long cycle of people moving from farms and small towns to big cities. Food production is going to be a big problem when oil and gas-based agriculture is no longer possible and we will have to re-establish a more meaningful relationship between urban places and a more productive agricultural hinterland. Our mega-cities will contract substantially. The fortunate ones will densify around their old cores and waterfronts though sea level rise may affect many harbor cities. 
this process of contraction is likely to be problematic and disorderly. In America, there is certainly the potential for ethnic conflict. Two horrifying crimes have exposed serious weaknesses in Connecticut's criminal justice system. But a three strikes and you're out law proposed by Gov. M. Jody Rell and Republicans in the legislature would do more harm than good. Last July two recently paroled men broke into a home in Cheshire and tortured and murdered three people. Last month a man who served more than eight years for assaulting a five-year-old and had been out on probation for less than a month broke into a new Britain home. He accosted two women wounding one and killing the other. Republicans, led by Ms. Rell, have responded by calling for a three strikes law. Democrats have rightly resisted the proposed law, which would mandate life in prison for anyone convicted of three violent felonies, is a bumper sticker solution that would create injustices by barring judges' discretion in sentencing. Modern wealth has been created mainly through the action of market forces, which now dominate the whole of the industrial world. It is based in the false premise that we all start at an equal point. Of course nobody starts at the same point. Market forces help a few to become very wealthy at the expense of the many who become poorer. This is taking place all over the world. There is an increasing number of hungry and desperate people living in utter poverty. Yet there are millionaires of all nationalities throughout the developed world. Market forces are inevitably acting to divide our world because they separate one section of society from another. Strangely enough, to create a society based in the free play of market forces, there must be a very strict control over the economy to ensure business efficiency. This is the poison of commercialization. Historically, reasons for the migration of Asians to the United States were similar in some ways to those for the Atlantic migration of Europeans to escape from poverty and civil war and to find employment opportunity and freedom. Chinese laborers were recruited to build the Transcontinental Railroad in the mid-19th century and provide domestic services in cities such as San Francisco. They were followed by the Japanese and Filipinos in the early 20th century who labored in Hawaiian plantations, California farms, and Alaskan canneries. Of these early Asian Americans, only the Japanese were allowed to immigrate as families at the insistence of the Japanese government. For these early generations, Asians in America were largely bachelor communities of temporary sojourners, with male to female ratios as high as 10 to 1. Asian American children in those early years were rare. Families are always related to the economy, the politics, the culture of the society. In herding societies young people go out when they're 10 or 12 years old and they hang out with the sheep or the goats or whatever the herd is. That produces a kind of a loose bond between the pre-adolescences and their parents. 
in industrial societies, we tend to keep kids in school for longer. And then college is that point when they might break or after college, depending on what they're doing. In agrarian societies families have lots of kids and put them to work. They structure themselves as large families and put them all together in one home. The main point is that families are not separate from the society. Families and the economy and the politics are all wrapped up all together. Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S. and at many archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige for people throughout the American tropics and the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird, whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Mimbres region. Turns out, nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. Crows, she says, are what's known as partial migrants. Every year, some members of the population migrate between breeding grounds and their overwintering grounds like parking lots, but others just stay put. So Townsend and her colleagues wanted to know if that urge to migrate was something individual crows can turn on and off. To find out, they captured 18 crows from overwintering spots in California and New York. They fitted the birds with little backpack satellite tags and tracked them for several years. Overall, three-quarters of the birds migrated, an average of 300 miles. And more importantly, if they migrated once, they did it every year suggesting traveling is not a habit they switch on and off. The researchers also found that migrating crows returned faithfully to the same breeding grounds every year but were more flexible on where to overwinter, which could be a good thing. Now, as you know already, there will be a midterm exam next week. The exam will be an open book, open note, an open internet resource exam. But you can't use a classmate or me during the exam. Many of the questions on this exam don't have definitive answers. I wish to assess your critical thinking ability and your ability to combine ideas. A poorly organized answer will not get the same grades as a well-organized answer. Here are some good ways to study for the exam. First of all, it would be better for you to organize and review your lecture notes. That means you many need to compile notes and lab test results if you have not done that already. I strongly suggest that you write trial outlines before the exam. I think it will make you feel more comfortable. Just stop by my office.
There is probably no marijuana-friendlier place in the country than here in Mendocino County, where plants can grow more than 15 feet high. Medical marijuana clubs adopt stretches of highway, and the sticky, sweet aroma of cannabis fills this city's streets during the autumn harvest. Lately, however, residents of Mendocino County, like those in other parts of California, are wondering if the state's embrace of marijuana for medicinal purposes has gone too far. Medical marijuana was legalized under state law by California voters in 1996, and since then 11 other states have followed, even though federal law still bans the sale of any marijuana. But some frustrated residents and law enforcement officials say the California law has increasingly and unintentionally provided legal cover for large-scale marijuana growers and the problems such as big money operations can attract. It's a clear shield for commercial operations, said Mike Sweeney, 60 a supporter of both medical marijuana and a local ballot measure on June 3 that called for new limits on the drug in Mendocino. Coca-Cola has bucked the trend for celebrity-fronted advertising by choosing a virtually unknown British artist to front one of its biggest UK campaigns, while arch-rival Pepsi features the likes of David Beckham and Beyoncé Knowles in its campaigns. Coca-Cola has hired the basement Jack's vocalist Charlene Hector to star in its first-ever UK branding campaign for Coca-Cola Classic. The advert breaks tomorrow and features Hector singing the Nina Simone classic I Wish as she walks through the streets distributing bottles of Coca-Cola. It is the latest in the company's new, real, campaign, which took over from the, always Coca-Cola, adverts and is aimed at giving the brand a more irreverent image the actress Penelope Cruz has appeared belching after drinking Coke and adverts in the US. The new advertising is the first campaign to be created by the quirky British advertising agency Mother, which won the Coca-Cola business last year after pitching against the company's long-standing US agency, McCann Erickson. Here are a couple different stories you can tell about our economy. One goes like this. Eight years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy has created jobs for 71 straight months. That's a new record. Unemployment has fallen below 5%. Last year, the typical household saw its income grow by about $2,800 the biggest one-year increase ever. And the uninsured rate is at an all-time low. All that is true. What's also true is that too much of our wealth is still taken by the top and that leaves too many families still working paycheck to paycheck, without a lot of breathing room. There are two things we can do about this. We can prey on people's worries for political gain, or we can actually do something to help working families feel more secure in today's economy. Count me in the latter camp. And here's one thing that will help right away. Making sure more of our families have access to paid leave. Hi everybody. This weekend, we'll dedicate the newest American icon on our National Mall the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a beautiful building, five stories high and some 70 feet below the ground, situated just across the street from the Washington Monument. And this museum tells a story of America that hasn't always taken a front seat in our national narrative. As a people, 
we've rightfully passed on the tales of the giants who built this country. But too often, willful or not, we've chosen to gloss over or ignore entirely the experience of millions upon millions of others. But this museum chooses to tell a fuller story. It doesn't gauze up some bygone era or avoid uncomfortable truths. We hope to have something meaningful to say in our next book about the efficacy of advertising. This is a huge question that impacts everything from commerce to politics to journalism. But for now, let me give one example. My kids were recently watching a Yankees Red Sox Day game on TV, broadcast on the Yes Network. One of the commercials was an anti smoking ad placed, I believe, by the city of New York. It was a gritty, documentary style spot featuring a surgeon talking to the camera, then showing the patient he was about to operate on. The patient was a man whose toes were blackened and rotting away. The image of the foot was extremely disgusting. It's gangrene, the surgeon said. And then he drew on the man's leg with a market to show where he was about to take his hacksaw and cut off the leg. The ad made a huge impression on my five-year-old daughter. Hours later, she asked out of the blue, are you still thinking about that boy's foot? People rarely translate another person's unique way of saying things with any degree of accuracy. This is because when we learn the meaning of words, we pick up their broad meaning but we've added subtle shades of difference which we get from our personal experiences. If you grew up in an aggressive household, the phrase, I'm angry with you, had different associations than for a person from a family where people talked through problems, we're left having to work out meaning from our own experience. So despite the fact that, say, Bob and Gina are both speaking English. Bob is really speaking Bob English, and Gina is turning that into Gina English, and the translation is never going to be perfect. To figure out these counterintuitive findings, the researchers conducted an experiment in a hotel room. They rounded up some lizards, gave them a perch, and used a leaf blower to mimic the effects of high winds. They set up a net to catch any lizards that lost their grip. As the artificial wind blew, the lizards moved so the perch took most of the airflow, but their hind legs would stick out. And if those rear limbs stuck out too far, they acted as sails. Eventually, those back legs were blown off the perch and the lizards were just holding on with their front two legs. And they could only hold on like that for so long as the wind speed increased further and further, until eventually they were blown off the perch and into the nets. So shorter back legs gave a survival advantage and a trait that might be passed on to the next lizard generation.
Last year, astronomers observed two neutron stars collide. A crash transmitted in gravitational waves to detectors here on Earth. Represented in sound, you can hear a small upward sweep in frequency. In the data, if you listen closely, several seconds later, the first waves of electromagnetic radiation arrived here on Earth the first time a collision has been detected by both light and gravitational waves and it's in studying the electromagnetic echoes of the collision that astrophysicists have gotten a far better glimpse of what really happened after those binary neutron stars merged 130 million light years away. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So it gives us an understanding of basically all the nitty gritty of what's going on after the merger takes place. Kunal Muli, an astrophysicist at Caltech. First, he says, the stars collided, creating a massive black hole-like object which started sucking up the cloud of neutron-rich cosmic debris left over from the crash, but its appetite was limited. Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist, but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing. White stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across a barcode, simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle recordkeeping. What I am trying to say is that the appeal and the settlement are separate. You mean that communications and announcements internal and external would be brought into the appeal process? Right, because they connect to the appeal. I hope you understand there are issues of reputation, and I have to deal with those in the appeal process rather than the commercial issues around settlement. And then, there is this legal claim for defamation. I believe that the implication would be to perceive in for defamation. Yes. I will investigate to what we have as written evidence and what we do not have. Okay, great. I am thankful for you to do that. When the time comes, its peers should follow suit. Of these, the European Central Bank faces the trickiest challenge, because it has acted as, in effect, the backstop to Eurozone bond markets, a mechanism that otherwise the currency bloc still lacks. But the main safety valve lies elsewhere, with banks and investors. Bitter experience has shown that debt-funded assets can magnify losses, causing financial crises. For this reason banks must be able to withstand any reversal of today's high asset prices and low defaults. That means raising bank capital in places where it is too low, especially the eurozone, and not backsliding on strenuous stress tests, as America's treasury proposes. In the end, however, there may be no escape for investors from the low future returns and even losses that high asset prices imply. 
they and regulators should take a leaf out of the intelligent investor and make sure that they have a margin of safety. We'll look now at a very interesting study. It was carried out by a researcher who works in two countries, Scotland and Italy, and it involved children from both of these countries aged around nine or so. Half of the children from each country spoke only their national language. However, the other half spoke their national language plus another language. During the study all the participants were given tests and quizzes which looked at a range of skills, including vocabulary understanding, problem solving, creative thinking and arithmetic. The children used their national language to complete the tasks, which involved things like copying patterns of colored blocks, orally repeating a series of numbers and giving clear definitions of words. The results were quite clear. The bilingual children were significantly more successful in the tasks. A really good illustrative example of the point I want to make is the book Journey Cake, Ho, by Ruth Sawyer. Based on a traditional folk tale, teachers often read this aloud to their classes, showing the pictures to the children as they do so. They are, of course, using the words of Ruth Sawyer, and presenting the story just as the artist has visualized it. But other teachers do it differently. Instead of reading, they tell the story from memory. This gives the children a much richer experience they can freely use their own imaginations, visualizing the story, the characters and the scenes in their mind's eye in any way they like. And, this is much closer to the way in which folk tales were passed from generation to generation orally, without any words or pictures to restrict the imagination. Hi everybody. It's Joe Biden. I delivered a report to President Obama laying out how far we've come since he put me in charge of the cancer moonshot that was back in January and lay out a real vision for where we need to go in the immediate future to, to do in five years what would otherwise take ten, to inject a real sense of urgency into the fight against cancer, and to change the culture and reimagine our system in order to be able to win. When President Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971, he had no army. He had no resources and no clear strategy. But after 45 years of progress, funding research, training scientists and physicians, and treating millions of patients, we now have the army. We now have tools, powerful tools. And with this moonshot, we now have a clear strategy for the road ahead. It matters, folks, because there's a consensus now that we're at an inflection point with science, medicine, and technology all advancing faster than ever and offering real promise.
According to the Roman Catholic Church individuals of the purest faith remain in a lifelike state after deaths, their bodies resist decomposition for centuries. Numerous cases were found in which people have been exhumed years after their deaths and were found preserved. The Church viewed this as a measure of sanctity. An incorruptible people whose bodies miraculously resist decay were canonized by the Church. Incorruptibility became a component of canonization the process of becoming sainted. This process of canonization included the prospective saint appearing in visions to people after death, performing miracles, either after or during life and incorruptibility of their dead bodies. You know, without getting into the details of exactly how that happened or how she got it out, let's just say it was a bad situation. And she panicked because, like for many of us, her phone is one of the most used and essential tools in her life. But, on the other hand, she had no idea how to fix it, because it's a completely mysterious black box. So, think about it. What would you do? What do you really understand about how your phone works? What are you willing to test or fix? For most people, the answer is nothing. In fact, one survey found that almost 80% of smartphone users in this country have never even replaced their phone batteries, and 25% didn't even know this was possible. Now crack your PTE sitting at your home. Language Academy brings to you the smartest AI-powered practice portal, with instant scores and feedback for all the tasks. Along with the practice questions, access free sectional and full mock tests, and get instant scorecard with in-depth feedback and analysis. For more hidden secrets, tips, strategies, and proven templates, click the link below and subscribe to our video course today.